I'm glad to have Harriet Senny here um, to talk about public art. <clears throat> um, Harriet has a new book, which I'll, I'll tell you about. But um, uh, if you don't know her, Harriet Senny is professor of art history at City College uh, CUNY, where she directs the MA program in art history and art museum studies, uh, where she also teaches at the CUNY Graduate Center. She is author of several books and numerous articles on public art, including contemporary public sculpture, tradition, transformation, and controversy, and tilted art, uh, the tilted art controversy, dangerous precedent. Uh, in addition, Seni is the co-founder of the international organization Public Art Dialogue. <laughs> She's the co-editor of its journal of the same name, which is also the only peer-reviewed journal devoted to public art. Her new book is Memorials to Shattered Myths, Vietnam to 9-11. It was just published by Oxford University Press. And um, she also has a forthcoming anthology that she's co-edited with Cher Knight, which will be published by Wiley Blackwell later this year. And that's called Companion to Public Art. So please join me in welcoming Harriet Senny. hear me okay? Yes? In the back row, just wave if you can hear me. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, so, thank you for that introduction, Leslie. Thank you for the invitation. And actually, thank you for suggesting the topic for tonight's talk, uh, which is considering public art in terms of the dialogues or conversations that it might prompt because it made me realize that many of my earlier publications, perhaps most specifically the Tilted Art Controversy, were based on the kinds of conversations that we were having about public art. While my most recent book that Leslie just mentioned, Memorials to Shattered Myths, Vietnam to 9-11, is actually focused on the conversations that the memorials to Vietnam, Oklahoma City, Columbine and 9-11 seem to prohibit. And I'll get back to that towards the end of this talk. First of all, let me begin by admitting that I began my research into public art several decades ago because I couldn't figure out what it was doing there. Maybe many of you still feel that way. Don't admit it, don't raise your hands. Uh, my PhD studies had focused on the Italian Renaissance sculpture. But because traveling to Italy for research wasn't feasible for me at the time, I decided to do a dissertation on public art that was built in New York City from 1950 to 1975, mostly because I really could not wrap my mind around that red cube in Lower Manhattan. What was it and why was it there? It is, um, in case you don't know, it's a sculpture by Isama Noguchi that's actually a rhombohedron. But guess what? Everybody calls it the red cube. <laughs> because who really knows what a rhombohedron is? I bet there's some of you do. Um, but when I looked up public art at the New York Public Library at the time, all I got were references to the art of public speaking, and I knew I was in trouble. Um, at that time, I was working down on Wall Street, not too far from this sculpture. And I was earning some money doing programming and systems analysis in the way early days of computers to help pay for graduate school. And as I progressed with my research, I interviewed Gordon Bunshaft, who was the architect of Skidmore Owens Merrill, uh, the firm that was in charge of this building. And that blue chip firm was known for including art in its projects. And Bunshaft himself was a collector of modern art. So in a tone truly appropriate for the naive graduate student that I then was, he told me it's for the client, just like he buys good furniture. Okay. Eventually, I came to the conclusion that such art also functioned as a kind of ornament after the fact for modern architecture, which had become increasingly nondescript and apparently somewhat interchangeable. Of course, Public art today is no one thing. It has evolved from a commemorative column or a general on horseback 
to include abstract sculptures such as this one, landscape or urban design elements, social practice, and even temporary spectacles. But depending on its form, it prompts different conversations, or none if you don't look up from your cell phone. Public art evolved because artists and public art curators or administrators' ideas changed about how it might best serve its users, us, the public, how it might improve our quality of life. And in that evolution, the emphasis shifted gradually from the art in public art to the public. But whatever shape it takes, public art often attracts controversy, which may not be the conversation we most want to have. There are many reasons for that. Public money and public space is involved. The audience is different from people visiting museums. They didn't choose to look at art in these spaces that they use on a daily basis, and therefore their expectations may be different. And typically, there isn't much information out there to explain it. So it's not surprising that perhaps the most common question is, what is that? Certainly, that was the question prompted by the Chicago Picasso. This commission set the scene for the public art revival that began in the late 1960s. Picasso was actively pursued by architect William Hartman, also a Skidmore Owens Merrill, but in Chicago, who stated categorically, we wanted the sculpture to be the work of the greatest artist alive. Hence Picasso. Towards that end, he pursued Picasso until the artist became engaged in the project. Keep in mind that Picasso did not typically take commissions, and had never been to Chicago. But the idea here was that the greatest artist alive would create a great work of art, and that's what public art should be. When it appeared, however, many people did not know what to make of it. It was compared, among other things, to a baboon, a bird, a phoenix, a horse, a seahorse, an Afghan how, I can actually see that one, a nun, Barbara Streisand, <laughs> I know that's my fable, and a Viking helmet. So that what is it question usually means what does it look like. So we get a lot of funny answers that make visual sense, but not in an art context. The art historical answer, however, doesn't make much more sense in a public art context, at least not in Chicago. In 1977, a decade after it was installed, an article by William Chappell in the magazine Art International demonstrated that the figure was actually the conflated image of Picasso's wife at the time, Jacqueline, and their pet Afghan hound. There you go. Kabul. In spite of this decidedly <laughs> personal content, the work over time became a civic emblem clearly identified with Mayor Daly's Chicago. <coughs> when local teams win, it sports the appropriate headgear. When the mayor died, a cartoonist depicted the sculpture set shedding a tear. And in 1997, at its 30th anniversary, an article in the Chicago Tribune announced, Chicagoans still don't know what to make of it, but there is a difference now. They like it. Or I would argue they're used to it have a sense of ownership and feel it's somehow theirs. You couldn't take it away now. I think there would be a huge um, objection. An even greater sense of civic identification, if not civic dialogue, occurred with La Grande Vitesse, which translates roughly to Grand Rapids, of 1969, the first sculpture commissioned by the National Endowment for the Arts, the NEA's Art and Public Places program. And I just want to take a moment to talk about this image, because usually the images you see of public art are really pristine and they're carefully posed. And this is one I had taken when I happened to be there and there was an Italian street festival going on. And I thought it would be nice to see the sculpture actually in use, as opposed to, you know, posed for some kind of publication. Um, in spite of the popularity and general friendliness of Calder's work, it was not initially without controversy in Grand Rapids, because at the time, Calder lived and worked in France, and so he was not perceived as properly American. His abstract style was not liked and or understood by locals unfamiliar with it. That included President Gerald Ford, and perhaps most importantly, it replaced a fountain originally planned for that site. Eventually, after a huge public relations campaign, 
The work was embraced as a Civic logo, both on stationery and garbage trucks. The <laughs> plaza was even renamed Calder Plaza, and one of the city's major cab companies today is called Calder City Taxi. Souvenir shops sell t-shirts with the sculpture's image, and postcards feature it along with other attractions. And I was asking Leslie about this earlier, this, you know, whether or not Saranon's arch functions like that a little bit for you here, do you think? <laughs> Yeah, and I think those images are important, and why not have art or architecture as a civic logo? But that's an arguable thing. Um, without doubt, the Grand Vitesse sparked a cultural civic identity that remains in place to this day. But as far as I could tell when I was there a few years ago, it prompted no conversation other than expressions of pride. It represented capital A art and provided the city with a certain kind of status that it lacked before. This practice of placing the emphasis on the art in public art was seriously challenged by the controversy surrounding Richard Serra's Tilted Art, cited in Lower Manhattan from 1981 to 1989. It was Serra's idea to make the sculpture site-specific, that is to say, designed specifically for that site and to incorporate a powerful visceral experience that he saw as a critique or challenge to the government that commissioned it, and that would be the General Services Administration, the federal government's percent for art program. And on some level, people got it. One woman called it the Berlin Wall of Fo Foley Square, referring to the general location of the work actually installed in Federal Plaza, the open space next to a federal building. The federal building in relationship to Tilted Ark would be where I'm standing. Okay, so on, the, on that side of it. Um, but there were many rancorous conversations going on simultaneously, all kind of lumped together. In my book, Analyzing the Controversy, I identified several contexts in which the sculpture could be discussed, each prompting a very different kind of conversation. Art, public art, public space, and public policy each defined by their own conflicting issues or their own controversy. So the art context. Public art is rarely discussed as art, and Sarah's work is not easily understood, even in an art context. Seen as both minimal and post-minimal, it was typically restricted to formalist or phenomenological readings. Subsequently, in a postmodern context, it was seen as demonstrating not only the decline of prescriptive modernism, that is to say, of abstraction, but also the presumed arrogance, if not malevolence, of the white male artists who defined it. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> By considering biographical elements, long denied relevance in interpreting abstract art, a different interpretation of this work is possible and one that sees it as a powerful kind of abstract expressionist statement linked to Sarah's conflicted Jewish identity. His mother was Jewish and admonished him at a very young age not to admit that he was. The public art context, although public art might be viewed by some as part of the art world, it really isn't. It operates outside the gallery system, and it cannot be shown in museums except by proxy, that is, by drawings, models, photographs, much like architecture in that sense. And most importantly, it functions different economically. It doesn't generate revenue because presumably it cannot be resold. This makes a huge difference. There are few ads and therefore fewer reviews. In the evolution of contemporary public art, tilted art represented something of an old order, considered less critically viable than work that addressed public use or public interaction. And it was in no way a typical work of modern public art that might be easily used as a civic emblem, as were the Picasso and Calder. Tilted art with its sweeping form and precipitous tilt could not be used except as a powerful art experience. And that was problematic in the bleak urban context of its public space. As you can see here, no seating, no shade, etc. Public space context. Let me see. Not the public space context, Federal Plaza was typical of the open spaces that had proliferated in New York since its 1961 zoning ordinance that encouraged their development 
in exchange for the permission to build higher. So in other words, put a plaza out there, you can make your building higher, it'll generate more revenue. Later zoning laws encourage public use rather than open space, often in a more easily patrolled interior setting with commercial amenities. People complained about no longer being able to cross the plaza once the sculpture was installed, but they couldn't cross it before either because of the inoperative pool. I think you can see that from this. There's no way you could have walked across it even without the sculpture. And, it, and, the, and the sculpture and the pool have also been since removed. In the media, Sarah's sculpture was blamed both for not improving Federal Plaza and for rendering it useless. At the time, there was an unstated expectation that public art should somehow function as urban renewal. The public policy context. From the start of the 1980s, and this work was commissioned or went up in 81, arts funding was challenged at the highest federal level, and by the decade's end, the very survival of the NEA was in question. Tilted Art was caught in bureaucratic struggles, both at the General Services Administration that commissioned it, and at the NEA, which appointed its selection committee. The controversy, which ended in a lawsuit that Sarah lost, revealed a potentially serious gap in her legal system with First Amendment rights that still appear to offer only limited protection for art as opposed to, say, literature, and especially abstract art, which is perceived as having no content. That's pretty interesting, and not a little scary. Um, installed in 1981, Tilted Art was removed nine years later for a multitude of reasons, and continues to serve as a signal that this kind of public sculpture, this kind of public art, <coughs> single object art sculpture, had to change. And change it did in a number of ways. One way was to become more friendly, to engage the viewing public in inviting ways. Anish Kapoor's 2004 Millennium Park Arch in Chicago at AT&T Plaza, and this is really a huge work, I don't know if it conveys this, it's 66 feet long, 33 feet high, 42 feet wide. You can stand underneath it, touch the surface, see your reflection, and then of your surroundings. Inspired by liquid mercury, it appears weightless because of its reflective surface that changes constantly. Actually, it's really heavy, it's 110 tons of forged, polished stainless steel. What Kapoor said, was that he wanted to do in Millennium, what he wanted to do in Millennium Park was make something that would engage the Chicago skyline so that one will see the clouds kind of floating in and those very tall buildings reflected in the work. And then, since it is in the form of a gate, the participant, the viewer, will be able to enter into this very deep chamber that does, in a way, the same thing to one's reflection as the exterior of the piece is doing to the reflection of the city around it, end quote. What people do around the sculpture, besides apparently enjoy it, is to remark about the various reflections and snap many, many selfies. This is public art that encourages you to play. More recently, other sculptors have taken a comic or whimsical approach to public sculpture and I have to say that I used this as the image to advertise the talk because I thought it would get your attention. Because it certainly got mine. Lawrence Argent's I See What You Mean, a project of 2006 for the Denver Convention Center, is a 40-foot high bear made from composite materials. The finish is a polymer concrete, similar in appearance to lapis lazuli, which is very expensive. The bear appears as if it is pushing its nose and paws against the glass of the convention center, as if wanting to see what is happening inside. In addition to providing an attention-getting chuckle, no matter when you see it, and it's equally amazing at night, maybe even a little more so, the artist was thinking about many things. He didn't want to conflict too much with the architecture, and he thought a lot about scale. He wanted to upset the balance of power between the viewer and the viewed. He said he was responding to cliches about regional Western art and the natural surroundings of Colorado, and somehow wanted to bring in the mountains, which he took to be the assumed idea of Colorado. And he thought about the bear as being somewhat representative of mountains. 
I've never heard anybody discussing the sculpture in this way, and I spent quite a lot of time there eavesdropping. Did any of you think of that when you saw this? <laughs> My guess, yes? Okay, <laughs> he would be pleased to know that. Um, mostly I heard them laughing, enjoying a joke even if they didn't quite get it. Um, I still don't understand the title, but I did thoroughly enjoy the sculpture. Tom Arternus takes a narrative approach to public art, using cartoon-like figures spread over a site to suggest a story that seems to be grasped in a general way by audiences. This installation, Life Underground, it's from 2001, is at the 14th Street, 8th Avenue subway stop in Manhattan, and it includes both single figures and narrative snippets like the alligator emerging from a manhole cover to grab a man, or sort of a man, in a moving aside to a review of public art, an art critic wrote in the New York Times that after receiving chemo treatments at a then nearby hospital, he would make sure to sit next to the Otterness figure on the bench while waiting for a train to take him home because it brought him comfort. Sometimes the most important encounters we have with public art, I would like to suggest, are deeply personal. And thus far, we've talked a lot about sculptures that are clearly recognizable as such. That is to say, they're clearly recognizable as art. That's not the case for a different kind of public sculpture paradigm or public art paradigm that acts as urban amenity, thus addressing a perceived lack in the urban environment. George Sugarman intended his Baltimore Federal, a work of 1975 located out of the Federal Building in Baltimore, as, quote, something the public can stroll in and sit upon, something they'll feel comfortable with, end quote. The judges who inhabited the building, however, saw it as dangerous, a security threat, something that rapists could hide in. I'm curious where, but no. Uh, with tilted art, the security guard worried that it might deflect bombs. And it's kind of interesting that public art is often perceived as dangerous when on some level it's not quite understood. While Sugarman always considered his sculpture primarily as art and wanted it to be seen that way, even if it provided seating, Scott Burton created work that is intended to look primarily like street furniture. This untitled piece of the mid-80s at Equitable Life in Midtown Manhattan, not too far from MoMA, is a good example of the furniture sculpture tension that his works incorporate. Clearly, a welcome addition is always much in use, weather permission, weather permitting. This is just the other side of the building, a different kind of seating that he designed. The conversations, if any, prompted by this kind of art are usually whatever its users feel like talking about. And with Burton's work, people are not typically aware that what they're sitting on is public art. Nor do I think they care, nor do I think they should. And also, under the model of public art as useful urban amenity, some artists began creating larger architectural elements. Sierra Amajani's Irene Hicks and Whitney Bridge, also of the mid-80s, links the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden at the Walker Art Center to Loring Park on the other side of the highway. Although it spans a multi-lane thoroughfare, Armijani's open work bridge, I think you can see it, yeah, that's a better detail, painted in pale yellow and blue, suggests a weightless, airy passage. The artist was a great admirer of the Russian constructivists who early in the 20th century advocated eradicating the distinction that separated high art from practical use. Or put another way, eradicating the hierarchy that still divides art and design. But by becoming invisible as capital A art, these works open the conversation up to anything. Eventually, public art dematerialized into a kind of social process that might or might not have an object associated with it. Variously called social intervention, community-based art, relational art, or a number of other terms this kind of public art is created by an artist working with a community on a project that addresses a specific local issue. One measure of its success is if the work outlives the period of its temporary creation. 
Curator Mary Jane Jacob used a number of influential public art exhibitions to explore various directions of this sculpture. Uh, I'll just show you two examples that were included in her 1995 exhibition called Culture in Action. And that took place in Chicago and prompted very different kinds of conversations. Inigo Manglano Ovalle worked with a group of youths living in an urban area often marked by gang violence. They created this work, Televisendario, videos of their experience in their community that they installed on 11 monitors in a work called Rest in Peace described by them as a temporary cemetery in memoriam to youth who had died in gang violence." End quote. The opening was a block party during which people were able to watch each other on TV and talk about the violence that had taken place in their neighborhood. The project continued locally under the auspices of a local organization. Ha ha, just like it sounds, a Chicago-based collaborative consisting of four alums of the Art Institute of Chicago worked with Flood, a volunteer network for active participation in healthcare, to create a hydroponic garden, which is what you see in the image on the right, to produce food for people with AIDS. According to the artist, quote, the garden can be used as a metaphor, not for medical treatment, but for caretaking of the social body as a personal and shared responsibility, end quote and included space for meetings and educational materials and prompted the formation of a buddy system to help those with AIDS where people work together to cook meals and deliver them. The artist established a link to the organization Open Hand Chicago to distribute produce. The garden itself was potentially mobile, that is to say it could be installed and maintained elsewhere in a home or a hospice. This project, too, outlived the exhibition. It brought people together in common activities to address a critical social need. Not surprisingly, both projects prompted conversations about public art that had nothing to do with art. They were issues that, were de that they were designed to address. I think it's great that public art may prompt any number of conversations, even if some of them are not constructive even if some of them are hostile. But today, I worry about the ones we don't have because we are too busy engaging with our phones. I had a student recently who observed that of 100 people passing a work that he was studying, only one looked up. I don't know how we're dealing with that, but it's something to think about. And I worry about conversations that we don't have at memorials that we might think we understand. The Bunker Hill Monument in Charleston, Massachusetts is 221 feet high, it's 294 steps, no elevator, and is made of granite from a nearby quarry in Quincy. It was intended to commemorate the Battle of Bunker Hill, which took place on June 17th in 1775, five, but which actually took place on Breed's Hill nearby, and it marks the first major battle of the American Revolution. The British Army actually won, but the fact that the untrained American Army managed to repel two major assaults and inflict many casualties on the British was enough for it to become, quote, a symbol of American military perseverance and heroism, end quote. Its subject is not immediately clear. When it was dedicated on June 17th on the 68th anniversary of the battle in a major national ceremony, Daniel Webster claimed that, quote, it stood for eternal American principles of patriotism and courage, civil and religious liberty, free government, and the moral improvement of mankind. Think back to the battle it was commemorating, right, the lost battle. It also stood for commitment of men, wealthy, middle, and working class, and more especially women, to the ideal of civic commemoration. Women's were, the women were the ones who had raised most of the money through bank sales and the like. For a time, Bunker Hill was used to celebrate the Irish heritage and working class immigrant bride of the neighborhood that grew up around it. But the meaning of a memorial is rarely fixed. In a public art project of 1998, the artist Christoph Wodisko projected images of faces and hands of local residents onto the monument as a loudspeaker played their words as they spoke of their mur murdered children or siblings. 
The artist intended to, quote, transform the gendered nature of the monument, which was intended to mark a very masculine wartime concept of sacrifice. Instead, he used the monument to mark private family pain in the civic battle of crime, end quote. The monument was thus, for a time, about victims rather than heroes. And as you can imagine, this prompted a very different conversation. But if even more concerned than the monuments whose meanings aren't clear and those <coughs> that don't stay fixed are those that divert our attention away from the events they were built to commemorate by focusing primarily on the victims and in the process, conflating them with heroes, the traditional subject of memorials. And this brings me to the subject of my most recent book, Memorials to Shattered Myths, Vietnam to 9-11. The Vietnam War, the Oklahoma City bombing, the Columbine High School shootings, and the 9-11 attacks all challenged myths of national identity. Vietnam was a war the United States didn't win on the ground in Asia or politically at home. Oklahoma City revealed domestic terrorism in the presumably safe heartland. Columbine debunked legends of high school as an idyllic time of first cars and first sex. And 9-11 demonstrated United States vulnerability to international terrorism around Wall Street, the symbolic center of its economic prowess. Memorials to these critical events focused overwhelmingly on individuals lost, thus conflating the functions of cemeteries where deaths are singular and grieving is personal, with the task of memorials to remember and mourn actual and symbolic losses by focusing on the victims and prompting an endless loop of mourning, these memorials divert conversations away from the significance of the events that resulted in these deaths. Kirk Savage, in his book Monument Wars, called the Vietnam Veterans Memorial the capital's first true victim monument and first therapeutic memorial. These are critical observations, one defining a new subject for memorials and the second a new role. The site of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, installed in 1982 between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument on the National Mall, defines <coughs> it as central to United States unity and identity, right, it's between Lincoln and Washington. Even though the undeclared war it commemorates prompted a political crisis that divided the country into antagonistic, antagonistic factions as nothing had since the Civil War. Thus, one might say that there is an element of denial implicit even in the site, that it is an attempt to convey, contain the war between revered national parameters. And although the memorial itself is considered successful, it is hardly contained the subject it was not allowed to address. Jan Scruggs, the veteran who initiated the commission, wanted to honor the sacrifice of those who fought by listing their names to separate the soldiers from the war. Maya Lin's wedding design was perceived from the start as a giant tombstone. People responded immediately as if the bodies were buried there, leaving tributes at the base of the wall much as they might at a local burial ground thus conflating the function of a memorial with that of a cemetery. Lynn's memorial became a prototype, particularly in the listing of the names of the dead, the use of a reflective surface, and the creation of a memorial complex. Not just the two sculptural additions associated with the Vietnam <coughs> Veterans Memorial, but also the not as yet completed education center scheduled to be located across the street altogether offering multiple interpretations rather than a single structure with perhaps more limited meaning. These elements are evident in, or in the case of Columbine, were planned for all the memorials discussed here. In all, the focus on victims is paramount and the relics pertaining to them are stored and some exhibited in adjacent or nearby structures. Here's just another view of people behaving at this as if it were like a cemetery. The cemetery rituals that are commonplace at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial are also a familiar widespread response to sudden death 
in public spaces, whether the result of a car accident, drive-by shooting, or intentional act of terrorism. Although this practice is sadly familiar, we have yet to settle on a term to define it, the most common being spontaneous or makeshift memorials. It seems to me that the most salient characteristic, however, of this contemporary ritual is its immediacy, answering the need to do something at once in the face of a terrible shock and tragedy, and also to be with others. So I refer to these, the cluster of these objects that people bring to the site of sudden, unexpected public death as immediate memorials. The, pra the practice stems from a very old and apparently nearly universal tradition of roadside memorials, and we are still creating those. Those commemorating traffic accidents include an implicit element of protest, often leading to campaigns for better signage, a stoplight, etc. As do those dedicated to drive by shootings, usually prompting calls to end the violence. There's certainly an element of protest in the immediate memorials to the larger scale killings discussed here. While this practice was made public at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, as we've seen, its continuity was built into the Oklahoma City Memorial by including a portion of what had been called the memory fence, initially erected to contain the site of destruction. People still leave things there. They were doing so the last time I visited. These objects are archived in the adjacent museum where a selection is on display. At Columbine, where there is no memorial museum, they're stored in the Littleton Historical Society. Some are occasionally exhibited there. And a number of the objects taken from 9-11 immediate memorials are included in the National September 11th Memorial Museum. I think all of them are by now digitally archived. There were a lot. These immediate memorials, which I consider a form of populist public art, provide a meeting place in a time of extreme shock where people may get some comfort from others, may try to regroup. The conversations that people have there vary, but they seem to be communal in the sense of expressing shared shock and fears, trying to figure things out and plan what to do next. Thus people provide and get some support. The bombing of the Alfred A. Murr Federal Building in Oklahoma City on April 19, 1995, prompted headlines proclaiming terrorism in the nation's heartland, a region presumed to be quintessentially safe. Its casualties were random victims who died at the hand of a young American Iraq War veteran disillusioned with his country and its values. Timothy McVeigh chose his target precisely because it represented the government. His attack on the two-year anniversary of the FBI-led siege on the Branch Davidian Combo in Waco, Texas, was both an act of revenge and protest. The 168 dead were going about their daily lives, as were the Columbine and 9-11 victims. This raises the question of categories of victims, a subject not as yet much discussed. For example, there are those who fight wars, whether by choice or draft, and are implicitly at risk. Those who die as victims of genocide, such as the Holocaust. And those who die during the course of their daily lives, including the civilian deaths that occur in acts of terrorism that in times of war would be probably defined as collateral damage. Victims of this last kind are at the center of these memorials and their related institutions. The process for creating the Oklahoma City Memorial emphasized the role of the victim's families and the personal grieving element over the communal significance of the event. The 350-member Memorial Task Force, appointed by the mayor and chaired by a local attorney, convened in July 1995, a scant two months after the bombing. Their charge was, quote, to create a memorial that is appropriate, enduring, non-exclusionary and, my underlines here, sensitive to the needs and feelings of those who were most directly affected by the bombing. Think back to Kirk Savage's definition of a memorialist therapy. The Oklahoma City Memorial was thus intentionally therapeutic in the sense that Kirk Savage defined, not only in its purpose, but also in its process. The practice of commissioning memorials as a form of therapy is 
I think, a very problematic issue that needs to be revisited. On more than one occasion, with only slight variations, former President Bill Clinton stated, Oklahoma City made us all Americans again. This encapsulated the way the Oklahoma City bombing and other crises for a time create a sense of community based on shared victimhood that then prompts a resurgence of triumphal narratives, in this case institutionalized in the adjacent museum. Edward Linenthal, who wrote The Unfinished Bombing, Oklahoma City and American Memory, had just finished a book called Preserving Memory, The Struggle to Create America's Holocaust Memorial, a model for the museum in Oklahoma City. The Oklahoma City Memorial suggested the influence of Holocaust memorials in more than that, however, since the architects Hans and Tori Butzer were living in Berlin at the time of the competition. Specifically, the central element of 168 sculptures of empty chairs, symbolic of the absent dead, evoke Carl Biedermann's then recently unveiled Holocaust memorial called The Abandoned Room. Intended to suggest the disruptive effect of the Holocaust, it consists of a bronze table and two empty chairs, one overturned. It is situated in the middle of the Koppenplatz, a quarter where Eastern European immigrants once lived and Jewish institutions coexisted with their Christian counterparts. The nighttime illuminations of the chairs in Oklahoma City may have been inspired by another Berlin Holocaust <coughs> memorial. Israeli sculptor Misha Ullman's library commemorating the infamous book burning of May 1933. It consists of a glass-covered subterranean room painted a stark eerie white and lined with empty floor-to-ceiling bookshelves. During the day, the covers often fog, rendering the memorial all but invisible, but at night it is lit up, drawing people to the light emanating from below. And so the very ground of Berlin, like the unconscious mind, seem, seeming to suppress trauma during the day, only releases it, hauntingly transformed into the night. The light emitted by the bases of the chairs at Oklahoma City is much more reassuring. It emits a golden glow rather than a white glare. But although it is above ground, it does seem to come from another or nether world. The rows of chairs in Oklahoma City prompted one landscape architect to think of Arlington National Cemetery, where the identical nature of the markers unites the individual. A woman whose mother died in the bombing objected to the chairs because, she said, they look like headstones in a ceremony. And Paul Goldberger, in a New Yorker article, lightened their appearance at night to a glowing field of votive candles, but he concluded they still resemble tombstones. From the start, the Butzers imagined that the chairs would provide a place for friends and family to leave behind tokens of their love. And this does happen, especially on bombing anniversaries and holidays, when people gather and leave things on them. The 10th anniversary of the bombing, which I attended, featured a series of events clearly intended to situate Oklahoma City in a historical and international community of victims. Its new status, evidenced by the presence of dignitaries and the media, was a direct result of the bombing. The city was now an acknowledged member of the worldwide community of terrorist victims, linked not only to Columbine and 9-11, but well beyond. In fact, the third Oklahoma element of the Oklahoma City complex, which closed recently, was the Memorial Institute for the Prevention of Terrorism. The Columbine High School shooting of April 20th, 1999, occurred just four years after the Oklahoma City bombing. The official memorial by DHM Design, however, was a strictly local enterprise, a modest structure near the school, but not visible from it. Although it's not the first or last high school shooting in United States history, it was actually the 10th, as far as I know. It was the one that prompted the greatest shock waves and media Response: Eric Harris and Dylan Kleinbold, who killed 13 and themselves on the 110th birthday of Adolf Hitler, planned their rampage for at least a year and described it as, quote, a means to a greater end, to terrorize the entire nation by attacking a symbol of American life, end quote. By this they meant high school 
American high school in an affluent middle class neighborhood. Littleton responded by eradicating as much evidence of the crime and criminals as possible. They deliberately omitted any reference to the shooters and rebuilt the library where the largest number of deaths occurred on the other side of the building and placing a mural of trees in what is now an atrium. The focus of the built memorial was on the victims and the community. The mission statement developed by the 20 member committee stated that the purpose of the memorial was quote, to create a respectful place where family members, members of the community, and visitors could go to gain an understanding of the innocent victims of Columbine. To create a memorial with content and purpose 100% derived from members of the Columbine community and keeping with the scale materials and natural forms found in the Columbine area. <coughs> to recognize and honor the deceased, the injured, the survivors, and community members. During the eight and a half years it took to raise necessary funds, Olinker, Chapel Hill, Mortuary, and Cemetery served as a de facto interim memorial. Thirteen black granite crosses emphasized the spiritual narrative that explained Columbine to many. As one frequent visitor observed, I think the people who were moved by this, they're not coming from a worldly position. The key elements of the build memorial are an inner ring of remembrance and an outer ring of healing. The inner ring is divided into 13 waist-high stone sections, one for each of the victims, engraved with their names and a personal reflection provided by their families. Over half the statements invoke God. The outer ring of healing is built into a hillside and the stepped perimeter red brick wall is inset with plaques engraved with quotes from students, parents, first responders, and some statements made at the groundbreaking, notably Bill Clinton's comment, by now a kind of official spin on tragedies that create communities of victims, quote, Columbine was a momentous event in the history of this country. Even in the midst of tragedy, we've seen the best, the best there is to see about our nation and about human nature, end quote. Here, too, many comments reflected religious preoccupations, but in a more secular and perhaps more frightening vein, one student observed, I don't think our school was any different than any other high school in America. There is no question that the killings of Columbine can be understood as an attack on the institution or way of life, much as the Oklahoma City bombing or the 9-11 attacks. Unlike the other memorial sites, Ground Zero is still considered a cemetery by some family members, and there are actual unidentified remains placed in a private chamber in the adjacent museum. Reflecting absence, the built memorial by Michael Arad and landscape architect Peter Walker owes much to Myelin's Vietnam <coughs> Veterans Memorial in, in the names as well as the design, this was the design that she sketched for this memorial. I'm sure you can see the resemblance. Lynn was in fact on the jury. With the focus on two voids sighted in the footprints of the tower, surrounded by massive waterfalls, it brings to mind the loop of the falling buildings replayed endlessly in the days following the attacks and on 9-11 anniversaries. Accompanied by the sound of rushing, continuously disappearing water, it recreates the experience of both sudden and ongoing loss. Before the opening, Aaron speculated that people would be drawn immediately to the void, staring into the abyss. Like the museum at Oklahoma City and the planned Vietnam Veterans Memorial Education Center, the National September 11th Memorial Museum features walls of faces of the individuals who died in these attacks. Arranged in a grid, they create the effect of a high school yearbook, ironically conveying uniformity rather than the individuality that was their purpose. All the memorials discussed here focus on the victims rather than the events that caused their death, events that challenge myths of national identity. Seen as an aggregate, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and its education center the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum, 
the Columbine Memorial, and the National September 11th <coughs> Memorial and Museum focus on the absent bodies, invoking their president, presence. In this way, they not only camouflage history, but ironically, define the United States as a nation of victims, exactly the concept there and their accompanying institutional triumphal narratives were apparently intended to obscure. By way of concluding, I would like to consider the definition of the Latin word for monument, monumentum, which derives from the verb monere, to warn, and thus signifies something that serves to warn, to remind with regard to conduct of future events. These are the conversations that we are not having because the memorials to shattered myths discussed here reflect a very different definition. Thank you. singularly. These deaths occur in an aggregate. An aggregate. Um, one thing I was wondering if we could do as a country, and your example serves as good as the automobile deaths that I'm suggesting, is what if we had a, an, a one memorial to all of these deaths every year? Maybe we'd get it. And maybe we won't. But yes, I think your point is really well taken. I have to say that one time when I talked about this, somebody in the audience raised the point of, well, why are these victims more important, she said, than my husband who died in his bed for a heart attack. Well, I never took it that far, but I could see her point. What is designated, I and mean, that's why I got into this issue of the category of victims. This is really a very political decision that we make in terms of which victim counts. I mean, it's the aggregate victims that count, and then we have to think about how are we interpreting interpreting them as a culture, and why is it that we're doing it like this? Has there ever been a memorial? Can you repeat the question? The, the initial question to which I expanded at length, I'm sorry, was um, there are how many murders were you saying there were in St. Louis? 188 murders here, and there were only 168, only, I don't mean it that way. There were 168 people killed in Oklahoma City, and what was different and I'm suggesting that deaths that occur singularly, like murders or roadside deaths, aren't perceived in the aggregate, so we don't have a sense of the accumulated loss. And pushing it a little further, I was thinking, what if we did an annual memorial to all the people lost by murder, by traffic deaths, etc.? Could we really focus on this, those issues with a little more clarity? Yeah, no. I understand that. And that's why there's a memorial there, because there's a guilt for We were killed, and the ones who live um, or, need to somehow say, you know, they, they did it for us. I'm, I'm not sure it goes that far, but I think what you're raising is, is also really, we're implicated. We're implicated, whether we feel guilty or not. We're implicated, and, and, and we're not dealing with the issues. None of these memorials, these memorials lead us away from the issues. I'm not saying that that's intentional, but when it keeps happening over and over again, I think there's a pattern that needs to be revisited. Suggest how, they, how to deal with the issues? How could that be done? I would love to hear some architect uh, talk about that. 
Um, I've just thought that what there really should be is more of a chronology of the event that doesn't focus on, on the victim so much, that gives us a sense of what happened to the perpetrators without making them famous, having rooms for conversations periodically. You know, if you had it, Oklahoma Museum is designed by chapters, by, they call them chapters, but if you had after each segment a room for discussion, posing some, you know, more societally relevant questions, queries. I wish I had better answers. I just know this is not happening. Yes. Well, I'm really impressed with this presentation because it just sort of turned, you know, my head or turned everything over on, on, the, on these ideas that I never really thought about that way and the way you present them. It's, uh, but the other interesting thing is we, we observe an individual we embody much more, we understand an individual much more than we understand a mass killing or mm -hmm. mass anything. And, and that's kind of an interesting uh, contradiction of, of, of this whole idea. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is in no way meant to disparage what victims' families are going through. That is not my intention. I have every, every empathy for it. But those things are personal. And I, I think really one of the questions that I'm raising by the focus on these of these memorials is why are we focusing so much attention on these victims? You know, the, the personal details that are revealed in these organ, you know, these institutions, they can't be meaningful to us. How could they? We didn't know these people. And if you think of memorials as going into the future, here's where I think. Let me back up a little bit. I think memorials should have a tripartite process, and I do suggest this in the book. I think there are the immediate memorials. How many of you have ever participated in an immediate memorial? Anybody? A couple of you. Um, I've known public art professionals who suddenly after 9-11 felt compelled to do that when they would never ordinarily have done that. The interim memorials, I think that's really important. Remember the Tribute and Light? Um, which serves such a great purpose in New York, but you know, and it's still ongoing, but after the attack, until the permanent memorial, my suggestion is that victims' families could be put in charge of designing, and you know, or suggesting what they need, not designing it. Um, let's leave that to the professionals. But what they need, do they need, you know, an object, do they need a place to gather, do they need therapy, whatever, let them say what they need and have that um, at least until such time as the permanent memorial is built. And let's leave the permanent memorial, the building of the permanent memorial, to people with some distance from the event. Those of you who have lost loved ones, and I'm sure that's everybody in the audience, you know that in the weeks after their deaths or the months even, you can't take a long view. You're lucky if you get out of bed in the morning, you know, kind of thing. How can you be designing a memorial, let alone having you know, some of the expertise that I know the people in this audience have to think about these things, know of other memorials, know where you can take this. So, so that's partly what I'm thinking is let's have a different memorial process. But Sabine, did you? Yeah, I have one question, and just also because you sort of alluded to it, I was wondering of how you would compare these memorials to Peter Eisenman's uh, memorial for the murdered Jews of Europe, just because for several reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, here it's the, you know, it's the victims who uh, make a memorial for the victims, but then it's also about individualized memory, and it is about you know basically the documentation of the history, but also you know with uh, all kinds of uh, computers that where you can access you know the personalized histories of the victims. So it's much more complex in many ways. So I was just wondering of how you would you know sort of compare it. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm thinking of the Eisenman Memorial as two parts. It's the sculptural component where people behave rather strangely and disrespectfully, not all of them, but many. Um, and then there's the, do they call it an education center? I'm not, documentation. documentation center, which I think functions really, really well. And there's even a distinction between that and between the Holocaust Memorial Museum 
which has a very different mission statement. I'm sorry I didn't bring it here, but it's all about understanding the role of the United States um, in World War II, the problematic aspect, it really complicates the narrative that is, is the more popular one. And I just think in general that Germany has done a really good job of trying to come to grips with the Holocaust, not that this is ever possible, but to do it in a less diversionary fact factor. I mean, when I've spent some time in Germany and I've seen that, I've, I've seen some of the other memorials there, the Stittenstadt, I think it's really strong. Um, I think the memorials there are more about owning up in a way that I don't think we've done in this country with slavery set. It just hasn't happened yet. Absolutely. Very interesting. Yes? So are you advocating that public art can serve as a sort of reinterpretation of um, like these perceived terrorist attacks uh, as opposed to like more self-victimizing memorials? I think memorials can function as a way of starting a conversation that might be more constructive in terms of thinking about why these things happen. I also think individual examples of public art can do that as well. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I think it's, you know, not of all public art, of course, but um, I think there's a real potential there to engage people in conversations that they wouldn't otherwise be having in places where they wouldn't otherwise be having them. I've also seen, because when I teach public art and I've taught it to undergrads and MAs and PhD students in New York, I always have a public art watch assignment where they have to pick a work of public art and then during the course of the semester they have to have, we develop sort of a general questionnaire in class and then they go out into the field and they have to, for the course of the semester, go several times a week, different times, talk to different people and see what's really going on there. And people have some very interesting results. I think one of the most interesting I ever had was this was when New York was not so quite, Manhattan was not so gentrified as it is now, but it was um, a sculpture in an urban park on Broadway and about 107th Street and it had a, a fountain and whatever. And the people who really spoke up for it, it was a fairly traditional work, were the homeless. Because they were in that space <laughs> the most. And they appreciated having something they thought was nice in their space. We could never imagine. I mean, I was like, okay, whatever. Um, because I could never have imagined that. So, and even, you know, the, the New York Times art critic who sat next to that sculpture, that improved his life in ways that, you know, we can begin to imagine. So do I think that public art could do that? Yeah, I do. 